I want us just to read a few verses of scripture before we uh, listen to Ken. They are very obvious passages. I'm just turning to Genesis and I want to read the first part and then the last part of Genesis 1. Let's remind ourselves of the true truth, as Francis Schaeffer used to call it, the true truth of God's word. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And then at the end, or the beginning of chapter 2, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Thank you, Ken. I'd like to thank Brian and the FAC for uh, granting me the privilege of speaking to you. And I know as a result, too, it's given our ministry over here more exposure to a number of different churches, pastors, Christian leaders. And uh, we've had a number of people come and ask us, how can we have a seminar or uh, some sort of creation ministry in our area, creation outreach? And so uh, for those of you who haven't met Graham, I just want to quickly introduce you to Graham Scott. Graham's a full-time worker who heads up the ministry over here in the United Kingdom, and they're uh, centered in uh, Swindon. And uh, Graham uh, helps coordinate our tours. Each year what we do is we have uh, a number of our speakers from America and from Australia associated with our respective ministries who come over here. Dr. Andrew Snelling will be over in October, and all of our speakers are very easy to understand, very layman. We've trained them that way, and they're also very evangelistic. And so maybe some of you are interested in having Andrew Snelling. He's a geologist, but uh, he's got an incredible message, and that's in October. I'll be back in June next year, August. Well, it's close to October. Uh, I'll be back in, 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 June, in June next year. And also Dr. Gary Parker, who wrote the book Creation, the Facts of Life. Brilliant communicator, Gary, just a lovely guy. He used to be an evolutionist and became a Bible-believing creationist. And it's interesting, when he debates professors at the universities in America, He's not just your ordinary creation debater. He admits that uh, he starts from the Bible and the message of sin and salvation and everything comes out through the debate. Because he said, what's the point of debating if we're not doing that? And, and so Gary will be uh, over next year as well. Uh, and also uh, Dr. Carl Wheland or uh, Dr. Don Batten from Australia. Again, uh, these people are ones that we associate with our ministry and we've concentrated on having a plain, simple, easy to understand message that relates all this to, to where we live today. So. Uh, if any of you are interested uh, in, in being a part of those tours, to put your name on the list for that, make sure you see Graham. He also goes around and shows the movie, The Genesis Solution, to various churches. So make sure you come and see him sometime, give him your name and address. Uh, also, a number of people have found it difficult to sign up for getting Creation Magazine and getting the newsletter that uh, Graham uh, is responsible for distributing over here. So what we're going to do while I start to speak now is we're going to just pass the sign-up sheets around on clipboards. If you've already signed up, don't sign up again. <laughs> And uh, if you uh, are not going to be signing up, that's fine. Just pass it to the next person. But pass it to the aisle and then pass it to the row behind and the guys will collect it. And we'll just do that uh, as I speak. Have you all seen that creature before? It doesn't come out real good on this overhead here at the moment. There we are. You know what that is? Dinosaur, Tyrannosaurus rex. I was wondering if there's anyone here believes that Dinosaurs once lived in the Middle East. <laughs> Is there anyone here? <laughs> Good. <laughs> You've really learned, haven't you? I was in a church in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Supposedly one of the leading conservative churches in the area. And I was to speak to the college group. So I went up there and they were singing and jumping up and down. And I think it was singing, but whatever they were doing... Anyway, it's quite a large college group, and they said, this is a real on-fire group. And they wanted me to speak to them. So I went up there to speak to them. And as I started, 
well, at the beginning of uh, starting my lecture to them, I first of all said, I want you to answer some questions for me. I said, you people love the Lord? Yes, you just were singing about Adam and Eve. Some song was Adam and Eve, yeah, 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 or something, whatever it was. And they said, yeah, we've been singing about Adam and Eve. I said, great, so you believe the Bible? Yeah, we believe the Bible. You people understand, uh, try to witness on the college campuses? That's right. And I said, great, let me ask you some questions. I'm, I'm going to be a skeptic this morning. I'm one of your typical college students in America that doesn't believe the Bible. Okay, how do you know there's a God? Uh, well, somebody answer that for me. And I went around the room. I couldn't get a decent answer. Eventually, one girl said, well, it's by faith. I said, what sort of faith? Blind faith? She said, yeah, I guess. I said, oh, that's interesting. You know, the Bible says give reasons for what you believe. Romans 1.20 says, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So if you don't believe, you're without excuse. That's what it says in Romans 1.20. So where's the evidence that God created? How would you defend that logically? Where did God come from? How do you answer that? And then I even got onto other things about, well, you believe in sin. What's sin? And we got onto doctrines of Christianity. And you know what I found? They didn't have a clue how to defend their faith. And yet this is supposed to be one of the leading churches in the area. This is supposed to be one of the most on-fire college groups you can find. By the way, that's not the exception. I find that's the rule as I travel across America and other parts of the world. You might want to try those questions on your own youth groups and college groups. And then you try it on the adults in the church who are the parents of the youth and the college groups and you'll find that they give the same answers. What's wrong? See, what I want to say to you today is this, and we're going to talk about what we call creation evangelism. It just takes a while to get to it, millions of years actually, but we'll, <laughs> we'll get there. Pastor, if I can say this to you, Christian leader, by the way, I know there are some pastors, a uh, number of pastors here and Christian leaders that believe the book of Genesis the way that we, we need to and should, and that's fantastic. Unfortunately, generally speaking, they're a minority, and uh, that's why we need to do something about that. But you can preach the best sermon in the world from Genesis being, you know, going through word by word, uh, an exegesis Genesis that is so correct and theologically precise and a, a beautiful message and totally miss the people sitting in the pews because they have some different questions because we've missed something. We've assumed they understand the basic of the basics. I suggest to you today that what churches have missed, we haven't taught our people the very basics of how do you know the, word, the, the Bible's the Word of God? And not only that, the people sitting in our pews, they've got questions like, where did Cain get his wife? <laughs> and what about dinosaurs? And, and not only that, they've got questions they don't even know they've got questions about because they've been so indoctrinated by evolution. It's sort of like I was talking to a couple of guys uh, over dinner last night and we, we got to talking about this analogy. It's like somebody coming to a doctor and before the person tells the doctor what's wrong with him, the doctor doesn't even ask the question. He just says, look, I've got these wonderful herbs for you. He says, but doc, I've got some, don't worry about that. I've got these wonderful herbs for you, but I've got a few problems. You know, this big thing eating, and look, don't worry about that. I've got these wonderful herbs for you. That's how I think it is in most churches. We've got this wonderful message for you, but doc, I've got all these problems and, and, and I, need, I don't understand. I, but don't worry about the problems. I just got this wonderful message for you, but doc, I've got all these problems. You see, that's where I think we're at in a lot of our churches. We can give wonderful messages, but the people have problems we're not answering. If I was to ask every one of you this morning right now, how would you defend that there's a God who created? What would you say? Where did God come from? How do you answer that? Because, you know, I had kids when I was a high school teacher and I taught biology in the high schools in Australia. Okay, sir, where did God come from, eh? And they sit down with a smile on their face. Ha ha, you can't answer that. And if you can't answer it, do you know what it does? It bolsters their particular belief that, see, I don't have to believe in your God. Let me show you just very briefly and there are many, many things we could do like this that I think we should be teaching in our churches that we're not teaching to help adults and children to be able to defend their faith. You can do it at different levels. So I'm going to do it at a particular level this morning. You can do it for kindergarten kids. There's just different ways of doing it. In fact, all my talks, even the ones I've given you, I give to kindergarten kids. I just give them in, little, in different ways, different words, but the same basic message. That's what I did with your children, uh, was it yesterday, last, the night before last, the ones that couldn't answer the question about dinosaurs in the ark. But anyway, here's how we go. Say I'm talking to some high school students, all right? When you came in here and looked at this building, what did you say? Wow, got here by an explosion in a brick factory. <laughs> of course not. You know somebody built this building. It's obvious it took information to get the order that's here. Or in America, I put up Mount Rushmore. If you've ever seen Mount Rushmore, the president's head's on Mount Rushmore. In fact, my favorite president over here, Abraham Lincoln. But anyway, <laughs> you know it's embarrassing when kids ask you if you're a living fossil? I mean, that really... <laughs> 
Well, students, how did Mount Rushmore get there? Well, it's obvious. It started millions of years ago. Wind and water erosion over millions of years. And of course, eventually, we get the president's heads on Mount Rushmore. And students say, of course not, sir. Somebody carved those heads. Took them years and years to carve those heads. Yes, of course, it took information to get that order, didn't it? And you see, what I would do then, and I'll have to do it very quickly with you, though, is, is, is I'll jump on to, now let's talk about us. Where do we come from? How do we get here? You know, it's interesting. You bring an atheist into a room like this and say, what got in here by chance? The speakers? No. The lights? No. The overhead projector? No. Did the organ arise by chance? Absolutely not. You know, what about uh, the seats? No. What about the carpet? No. Has anything here got here by chance? Oh, yes, the most complicated thing in the entire universe. You. I mean, there's something illogical about that, isn't there? But you see, if we go to our genes, not the ones we wear, the ones in our cells, we're made of trillions of cells. And in nearly all of your cells, not the sperm and the egg, of course, because they only have half the number of chromosomes, but in nearly all of your cells, each cell has all the information, everything that builds you. And if you were to type it out, it's been estimated to fill a thousand books, 500 pages, close type written. It's a lot of information, isn't it? They now think that's way underestimated. There's a lot more information there than they realize. Where did that information come from? You know what the teachers teach in school? See, if you don't know what the teachers are teaching in school, you know, one of the unique things about our ministry, as we get out and we move across the world, we have people coming and asking us questions and college students and students because we get to know what they're being taught. Pastor, Christian leader, deacon, Sunday school teacher, do you know what the students have been taught? Do you know what they've been indoctrinated with, the ones that are sitting in your pews and in the chairs? Because if you don't, you're not going to reach them. You need to get out in the big bad world and understand that. Now, that doesn't mean go to those things, but it means you need to know what they're being taught through the media, through whatever. But you see, the way the teachers taught this in Australia, and I believe they do it in other parts of the world, was like this. Students, you don't need to believe in God. That information in your cells, it got there by chance. Look, I'll explain it to you. Take the letters of an alphabet, A to Z, cut them up, A to Z, depends what country you're in. Cut them up, put them in a hat, and you start passing the hat around. Billy pull out a letter, by chance he pulls out B. Well, okay. Mary pull out a letter, by chance she pulls out A. Mary, and uh, Kathy pull out a letter, she pulls out T, B-A-T, back. We got a word by chance. That's true, we got a word by chance. Given enough time, students, even though it sounds improbable, but you've got to admit it is possible, even if it's remote, given enough time, you could eventually get a series of words. Hmm? That's true. So given enough time, you could get an encyclopedia. Right? Now, you might laugh at that, but you think about it. From the student's perspective, it's possible. Even as remote as it sounds, it's still possible. See, therefore, students, it just happened millions of years ago. The right chemicals came together in the right order. All you need is the right order, and there you are. Bang, you could get life. Now, what's wrong with that analogy? There's something dreadfully wrong with that analogy. And you know what the students aren't taught? You see, the word B-A-T, is it a word to a Frenchman or a Dutchman or an Englishman or a Chinese or a Japanese? It's only a word to somebody who already has what? The language. See, the order doesn't mean anything without a language. You know, in your DNA, the order of those molecules in your DNA, the order is really meaningless without the language, and there is a language system in the cell that reads the order. You can't have the order without the language, and the language wouldn't make sense without the order. Where'd it come from then? Because it's not just good enough to get an order, you've got to have a language that exists to make the order make sense. So you know what I would say to my students? Do you know what we observe in science? Never anywhere, anywhere do we ever see information systems, information, the order and language, coming from disorder by chance. It always takes information to get information. And where did the information come from to build this building? The people that designed it and built it, a greater amount of information. Where did the information come from in yourselves? It had to come from a greater amount of information. Where did that come from? A greater amount of gain. Where did that come from? A greater amount of gain. You extrapolate backwards all you like, but what's the only thing that makes logical scientific sense? You have to start with infinite information. What's the first words of the Bible? In the beginning, the infinite creator God. And so you see, students, where did God come from? It's obvious. God's always been. He's infinite in knowledge and wisdom. Actually, my observations in the present, I can logically defend that. So students, let me ask you a question. What do you believe? Matter came from nowhere for no reason. Matter always existed. Matter by itself arranged itself into information systems against everything we observe in science. I'm sorry, son, you've got a problem. I haven't. You've got a blind faith. I don't. I can defend my faith. You can't. You've got the problem. You ready to listen? You know what, Mum and Dad? Really, those things are quite easy to understand. 
And that's the way we should be teaching in our churches and the way we should be teaching in our young people and college groups these days. There's lots more you can do. You know, with little kids, with my own kids, Daddy, build me a building out of Lego blocks. Sure, you get them all together, dump them on the floor. There's your building. Didn't work, Dad. You know why? We've got to put information into the system to get the order out, you know? When, when your wife smashes up the motor car, what do you say? See what happens when you don't put intelligence into the system, right? <laughs> Sorry about that. But see, you have to put a lot of intelligence in now to get the order back, don't you? Isn't that right? <laughs> As I said to the young people on Tuesday night, I said, how do, you, how do you get a Rolls Royce? You get a VW and you slam it into a brick wall. <laughs> yeah, that's how I got my color TV. <laughs> you know, I, uh, actually, I had a problem. I took my radio and I mutated it, smashed it with a hammer and only got black and white TV. But anyway... You see, people, that's why Romans 1 says, if you don't believe in God, you're you're without excuse because it's so obvious there's a God. But you know what? We need to logically defend it. Now, I can't scientifically prove it, but we can logically defend our position, and we need to, and to show the fallacy of the other position. And what a difference it makes to young people, I found, when, when, when they're witnessing and can say, I can defend my faith. I'm on the right side. You've got the problem, not me. But the trouble is we're producing kids from our churches and from our, our college groups and so on and youth groups and Sunday schools, they're frightened to witness out there. They're not game to say much because they don't know what to say because we haven't taught them that way. They know about Jesus on the cross and they know about the feeding of the 5,000 and, and so on. You know the problem? See, I believe most Sunday school curriculums, Bible study curriculums and so on are almost a waste of time today because here's what happens. Now, don't get me wrong. Please don't get me wrong. All we do is we teach Bible stories. Now, I'm not saying don't teach Bible stories, but understand what I'm saying here. We teach Bible stories. We teach Bible stories. They go out in the big bad world and what's happening? Through the media or wherever they're influenced by, maybe they go to public school or whatever, they're being told the Bible's not true. Noah couldn't get all the animals on the ark. There never was a world flood. The world's billions of years old. Man evolved from the apes. They come to church and what do we do? Bible stories, Bible stories, Bible stories, Bible stories. They go out and they watch TV and David Attenborough and all this sort of stuff and what are they being told? The Bible's not true. Man evolved from the apes. You can't trust the Bible. There is no God. You read the newspapers. There's no God. You can do what you want anyone's opinion counts we, we you can defend homosexual behavior they come to church and what do we do we teach bible stories we teach bible stories do you see what the problem see people we've lost it because we haven't taught them foundationally and we haven't changed our way of teaching now you don't change the message of the bible but you need to change your way of teaching in response to what satan has done in the in the culture to get them away from believing the bible most churches today still use the same methods of teaching from generations ago but the culture's changed. Different language today. That's what I want to show you as we go through. See, so many other examples that I could give you. You know, it's, it's interesting. When I went to school, I was taught, here is the classic origin of life experiment to prove evolution. They have this apparatus, Stanley Miller, 1953 in Chicago. And this, was in, this is probably still in the public school textbooks here in England. It was, it's the classic experiment, origin of life experiment that appeared in most public school college textbooks across the world. Does anyone remember being taught that? The Stanley Miller experiment, I see a few hands around the place. Some of you probably were and probably can't remember back that far. But anyway, have a look at this. What happened? They put gases that they thought were in the original atmosphere. You know, when I went to school, I never thought of asking my teacher the question, excuse me, sir, yes, where's the sample? That's the same question as were you there? That's a really important question. Zappa sparks through it. Zappo forms some amino acids down here. Amino acids, basic building blocks of life. They make up proteins. We've basically formed life in a test tube. Headlines in newspapers in America. Life formed in a test tube. What'd they do? Form a, some amino acids. So what? That's not a life. Life's mu- made of mu- many more things than that. In fact, even if you made chemicals, have a think about this. If you've got a frog, I, I don't suggest you necessarily try this, but... If you've got a frog and put it in a blender, <laughs> do you realize you've got all the components necessary for life? In fact, you've got DNA and you've got all these proteins and RNA. You've got everything you need. But a frog ain't going to crawl out of that blender. <laughs> in fact, you've got everything an evolutionist wants. You've got all the molecules necessary for life. What's wrong? It's disorganized. (laughs) See, you can have all the chemicals you want, but if you don't have the organization, it's not going to work. You can try to put that frog back together again, but you're not going to be able to do it. 
You know, the next time you kill a mosquito, there's a squash mosquito. You can say to your kids, doesn't that remind you of creation? A dead mosquito? Why did it die? Well, it's easy, you smacked it. That's not the real reason it died. It died because I disorganized it. You're going to look at these things differently from now on, aren't you? Now, see, the point here is, so what, you form chemicals. That's got nothing to do with life, forming life. But not only that, what they didn't tell you was they formed two types of amino acids, left-handed and right-handed, and life is built up on the basis of left-handed amino acids. You could never form life at all from that mixture. But, you know, even if they did make life in a test tube, of course, think, think of how illogical this is. You imagine a professor, 50 years dedicated research, millions of dollars worth of equipment, and he says, if I can just synthesize life here in a test tube, I'll have proven no intelligence was necessary in the beginning. <laughs> now, let me tell you that that experiment, Stanley Miller's experiment, I think you'll, be, you'll see a pattern of what I've been doing this week here. Stanley Miller's experiment stood for years and years as the classic original life experiment in schools and textbooks, and particularly in America and Australia, and I presume here as well. And then it's interesting, in uh, 1993, Time magazine, on an article on the original life, Stanley Miller's glass jar experiment 40 years ago suggested the components of life were easily manufactured from gases in the atmosphere. The conditions he created in his laboratory faithfully reflected the prevailing wisdom of the time, it was, says the author, a beautiful picture. Unfortunately, adds, it's probably wrong. <laughs> so much for that. By the way, after I did all this with these young people, this college group, here's a letter I got from the church. The man who runs the mid-high youth department was so dismayed at the way the kids defended their faith as you played devil's advocate that he's putting together a whole apologetics curriculum with the kids, including giving them some creation evangelism background. It made him sit up and take notice that the kids needed to get back to the basics. And people, I suggest to you that that's true of just about every youth group, college group, and adult group, and church in this nation. Imagine opening up the newspaper and reading this. You see, those kids, because they didn't have that foundation from Genesis, where do you think they could end up down the road? Amazing grace lifts softly into the North Carolina pines from the meeting room where voices gather greater further with each verse in praising God. Take away the video screen and music. It might just be another Saturday night in a Christian campground tradition that predates Billy Graham. Except the woman leading the song has no clothes on. Her husband wears only a T-shirt and all others are similarly undressed. Welcome to the first Christian nudist conference. And so in America recently, it got headlines in the newspaper. Clothes really don't make the Christian. And in fact, in the article, it said this. Christian uneasiness with nudity goes back to the biblical account of Adam and Eve, who were clothed by God after eating the forbidden fruit. Boy, they're right about that, aren't they? Public nudity is associated with original sin. That's true. And most Christian denominations encourage modesty in dress. Right. But if churches emphasize fallen human nature since Adam and Eve disobeyed God, some nudists contend Christians can recapture a purity of spirit regarding creation. We can get back to that innocence in Genesis. You know what they're denying? They're denying that they're sinners. They're denying the fall. And you know what, people? Because we've been so indoctrinated with millions of years, you know what happens? We've gotten away from understanding the fall. I believe that our children growing up, our young people, don't understand the holiness of God and the sinfulness of man because they've been so indoctrinated in evolutionary philosophy, they don't understand. That's why even Christians today don't understand sin. You see, I had a little boy come to me and he said, sir, why did God let my grandmother die? And I thought to myself, his parents haven't taught him properly. Because you know what we've taught our children? Like when my father died in June last year, where's Papa? He's with the Lord. Why did he die? Because of sin, Dad. Whose sin? Our sin in Adam. So whenever you see death, what should you think of? How sinful we are and how we need to fall on our knees before the Lord Jesus Christ? So who's responsible for death and suffering? Do we blame God? No, Dad. It's our sin. That brought that judgment from God. You don't blame God. It's our sin. You know, there's an incident here that got headlines around the news. Very sad. Those children that were killed in that school. Boy, you know, I, I, I'm sure you, like me, when I sat there, I identified with those parents. Imagine if that was you and you received that telephone call. But you know what happens? Why did God allow this? Why did God do this? But if you understand sin, 
Even more, it should make you fall on your knees and say, woe is me. How sinful, what a, what a sinful world. How bad is sin? This is terrible. We need to fall on our knees before the God of creation. It's just like when that Oklahoma bomber blew up the, the building in Oklahoma in, in the States. A clergyman got on TV and you know what he said? A clergyman got on and he said, why did this happen? We, you know, we can't understand why these things happen. My children said, we can understand that. Men are, men are sinful. That's why it happened. You see, people, we've lost that foundation in Genesis. And we need to get back to that foundation. Because, you see, when we want to go out and preach the gospel today, we've got to understand that without Genesis, without an understanding that sin entered the world, because there was a literal fall and death was a penalty for sin, how can you preach the gospel? See, I like to look at it this way. The gospel really consists of three major aspects. There's the aspect of creation, sin entered the world, death as a result, a perfect world to start with. Now there's something wrong with it. It's groaning, as Paul says in Romans 8. That's the foundational knowledge we need to understand why Jesus became a man, the last Adam, to suffer death, because death was the consequence of sin, to be raised from the dead, so that one day there is going to be, because of what he did on the cross, a new heavens and a new earth in which death will be thrown in the lake of fire. There'll be no more death. There'll be no more curse, it says in Revelation. It'll be removed. No more crying, no more weeping. But you see, if you don't have this foundation, what's going to happen? Let me read to you from an Anglican. I don't know why I always quote a lot of Anglicans in these talks this week, but hey, they write the stuff. In the Church of England newspaper, Tom Ambrose, an Anglican clergyman, wrote an article called A Current Affair, on this section, Current Affair, October 21, 1994. So that's not long ago. Just a couple of years ago. And this is what he said. When we'll, see, one thing about this guy, he's totally right. He's totally wrong, but he's totally right. He's totally right and he's totally consistent, but he's just totally wrong. He said this, when will the church really come clean about evolution? He goes on and says, once we admit, in other words, once we admit evolution, once we agree with that, which is what he does, that we share a common ancestry with other animals, certain consequences follow. Fossils are the remains of creatures that lived and died for over a billion years before Homo sapiens evolved. He's right. If you believe in evolution, you know I me, mean? he, he's consistent. Death is as old as life itself, by all but a split second. Can it therefore be God's punishment for sin? He says the fossil record demonstrates some form of evil has existed throughout time. He understands the fossil record. It's full of death, bloodshed, disease, suffering. It's awful. On the large scale, it's evident in natural disasters, the destruction of creatures by flood, ice age, desert, earthquakes has happened countless times. On the individual scale, there's ample evidence of painful, crippling disease and the activity of parasites. We see that living things have suffered in dying with arthritis, a tumour, or simply being eaten by other creatures. It's a horrible world. Look around. That's you know, sometimes why I get a little upset when we sing, all things bright and beautiful. We need another verse. All things marred and mutated. The Lord God cursed them all. <laughs> From the dawn of time. See, we give the wrong idea to people sometimes. All things are not bright and beautiful. You go to Australia... And you go up the, and, and you're, you, you go into the northern tropics, into the rainforest area, and you brush yourself against the, the gimpy gimpy tree, the stinging tree that it sends horses crazy. They jump over cliffs. I mean, you, in excruciating pain, you then run down to the ocean to wash yourself and, and you stand on one of the blue ringed octopi that can kill you in minutes. And then you fall into the ocean. You're stung by one of our deadly sea stingers that can also kill you in minutes. And so you rush out of the water now and you fall into one of the freshwater creeks and just as you're taken into the jaws of one of our man-eating crocodiles, you sing, all things bright and beautiful. <laughs> By the way, how do you explain a world in which there's death and life, joy and suffering, health and disease? How do you explain a world like that? You know, how can there be a God when you have all these beautiful children killed by an evil man. How, how can it be? When you understand it was a perfect world that's marred by sin and you see a remnant of the beauty there, oh, but you see sin and the consequence of it, the curse. See, people, most of us look at the world today and we think, oh, it's sort of gone on for millions of years and we don't think in terms of this is not like the original world. This is different. And this guy goes on, he says, from the dawn of time, the possibility of life and death, good and evil, have always existed. 
At no point is there any discontinuity. There never was a time when death appeared or a moment when the evil changed the nature of the universe. God made the world as it is with evolution as the instrument of change and diversity. What a horrible God. People try to tell us that Adam had a perfect relationship with God until he sinned and all we need to do is repent and accept Jesus in order to restore the original relationship. But perfection like this never existed. There never was such a world. Trying to return to it either in reality or spiritually is a delusion. Unfortunately, it's still central to much evangelical Christian preaching. What a great message. There never was a paradise. Never will be a paradise. Death, struggle, disease and suffering. That's what God's all about. Become a Christian. It's a great life. <laughs> By the way, what do these sort of churches do when they have funerals for those sorts of children what hope is there for the parents parents what you see that's what our God's like instead of saying do you realize when we see death as well as understanding sin and everything else we should understand the love and mercy of God as Peter Lewis has been talking about and that he came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ to suffer that same curse of death for us be raised from the dead you see Christianity has the answer if you have Genesis Without Genesis, you don't have the answer. And people, we've lost that foundation. And you see, I want you to think about this verse here, because as we lead up, I'm just getting on to the talk now. <laughs> as we lead up to looking at this, we're going to look at a few passages of Scripture here, so I'd like you to get your Bibles out. 1 Corinthians 1.23. I want you to remember this through the rest of this talk here. 1 Corinthians 1.23. But we preach Christ crucified under the Jews a stumbling block, but under the Greeks foolishness. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to the Greeks, but a stumbling block to the Jews. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to the Greeks, but a stumbling block to the Jews. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to the Greeks, but a stumbling block to the Jews. Okay, I want you to remember that. I always was a believer in rote learning for my kids. And penalties if they didn't know it. Remember that. Okay, as you keep that in mind, and as you understand the way in which I, I see the, the full gospel, if you like, here, and understand the foundational nature of it, let's turn to Acts chapter 2. Now, I'm not going to read through all of this. Most of you should be familiar with this, with this anyway, but let's summarize. In Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, you have Peter preaching a message, very boldly. And what was his major message? Actually, it really was this center part here about Jesus Christ crucified, raised from the dead. His major message concerned... Jesus' death and resurrection. For instance, verse 23. Him being delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Boy, talk about bold preaching. I mean, you people, you crucified the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You know, I think we need to get a little blunt these days and start doing some decent preaching. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. And you can read through the rest of his sermon there. Verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And what happened? You know, verse 40. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there added unto them about 3,000 souls. Man, talk about a revival meeting. 3,000 souls committed their life to the Lord. And you know, it's true that many evangelists have sort of patterned their evangelistic methods after Acts 2, if you like. And the major message is, we need to get out there and tell people, repent of your sin. That's true, we need to do that. We need to tell them about the message of Jesus on the cross. That's true. And raised from the dead. The message of salvation. That's right. And so many of the great evangelistic crusades of the past and, and some of the great evangelists, that's their major message. Have I want you to think about this for a moment. Who was Peter really preaching to? Actually, he was mainly preaching to Jews or those convinced of or familiar with the Jewish religion. Now, in those days, wouldn't you say, would you say that the Jews were creationists or evolutionists? Creationists. Of course, they believed in the God of creation. They had the writings of Moses. Did they know what sin was? They had the law of Moses. They knew what sin was. Sin was adultery. Sin was taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Uh, they, they knew what sin was. Did they know why death was in the world? Boy, in their history, how many animals had they killed and shed the blood of as a picture of what was to come in Jesus Christ? Boy, they knew why there was death in the world. My point is this, did they have that foundation there? Yes, they did. See, Peter was preaching to a creationist culture that had the foundational knowledge to understand the message of the cross. But their stumbling block was that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. And so that's where he concentrated, in this section here. He could assume a foundation to build the rest of the structure. Like coming in to build an auditorium, the foundation's there, but what we need to do is build the rest of the structure. 
You know, in, in, uh, in our street, they build basements uh, where we live. And once they get the basement and the foundation done, it seems to take a long time. But once that's done, when they come in to build the structure, it seems to go up overnight. Because when the foundation's there, it's a much easier job to build the structure. Okay? Keep that in mind. The preaching of the cross, stumbling block to the Jews. But foolishness to the Greeks. So let's turn over quickly to Acts chapter 17. In Acts chapter 17, starting at verse 18, we have here Paul in Athens on Mars Hill talking to the Greek philosophers, the Epicureans and the Stoics. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. Now, what happened when he preached the message of the resurrection to the Greek philosophers? What nonsense is this? What foolishness is this? What are you talking about? What's all this about? The preaching of the cross, foolishness to the Greeks. Who were the Epicureans and the Stoics? Well, the Epicureans, they followed Epicurus. They, they believed there was no purpose in nature and everything evolved from the earth. And sensuous pleasure was the chief good of existence. The Stoics were pantheists. But you see, pantheism is evolutionism. The Epicureans were evolutionists. Now, different to Darwinian evolution, but evolution nonetheless. See, Darwin didn't invent evolution. He just popularized another form of evolution. The Greeks were not a creationist culture. What sort of culture were they? Evolutionist culture. Did they understand about creation? The Greeks had no concept of the God of, of creation as the Jews would understand, responsible for, transcended to, upholding the creation. No concept at all in their culture. Did they understand sin? They had no concept of sin. Did they understand death? They didn't know why death was in the world. Did they have this foundational knowledge? No. So when Paul preached to them the message of the cross, what happened? They didn't have a clue what he was talking about. What foolishness is this? So what did Paul do? He looked around. And because there's a lot more you could say about these things, I'm just doing it very briefly for you. And he saw all these altars they had. Verse 23. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. It seems something had happened in their history that they knew there was something more. Actually, when you think about Romans 1, that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath revealed it unto them. It's written on our hearts. We know there's a God. They know there's something more. Romans tells us about right and wrong written on our hearts. We have a conscience. So he says, let me tell you about the real God. Now look at the emphasis of Paul's sermon here. Verse 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing that he giveth to all life and breath and all things that have made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. What did Paul do? He ran a creation seminar on Mars Hill. The first creation seminar to the Greeks. That's what he did. You know who the real God is? He's the creator. That's the difference. Our God's the creator, like Isaiah said over and over again. But our God is the creator. He's the creator. He's the sustainer. He made of one blood. You see, you're all related. Paul knew. We all went back to one man and one woman. Look at his teaching in Corinthians, for instance. He understood about that. You're all related. He knew about the last Adam. And so he was giving that foundation. Do you know what Paul was doing? See, as you go through the rest of Acts 17, he starts off with the power of God in creation, the goodness of God in his providence. He then speaks against their wrong religion. He opposes their idol worship. He then tells them they need to repent. He gets back to talking about that God is a God who judges. Look at verse 31. See, remember, before you even look at that, remember Paul said he wanted to preach nothing else than Christ crucified. Don't get me wrong in what I'm saying today because some people might think, well, you're trying to say we shouldn't preach the message of the cross. No, 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 that's the message we want to preach. We've got to get to that. We, but here's my point. There are so many people today that don't understand the message of the cross because we're approaching it the wrong way and I hope you start to see some of this here with Paul. Paul wants to get them to understand the message of the cross. As Peter Lewis has, has been expounding so beautifully in, in, in these morning sessions. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead this time, verse 32, or verse 31 first of all, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Now he gets back to the resurrection. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Some still said, huh, what nonsense is this? But look at the difference. Others said, huh, we'll hear thee again on this matter. Mm-hmm. He was a young man I was talking to last night. I didn't realize he was at the conference. I'm going to get him up to talk to you a little later on, I think. And uh, you know what he said to me? Went to your creation seminar. And he said, I was an atheist. 
And he said, I listened. And I went away and thought about it, checked out some books, read some things. And he said, but that was the turning point in my life. And the Lord used that to bring me to himself. And here I am, an on-fire, Bible-believing Christian here at this conference because of that. You see, he was one of these people that said, huh, ah, well, here they are going in this matter. This is it. Never heard this before. This goes against everything I've been taught. I, I need, to, need to hear about this. You know, we see a lot of people come to the Lord through our ministry after we've been to an area because of the nature of this pre-evangelistic ministry. And then, notice something here, certain men clave unto him and believed. Some actually believed. In fact, one of them was the leader of the Supreme Court in Athens who became the leader of the church at Athens. There are actually some conversions. Now, there are Bible colleges in America. I had a student come to me just recently and he said, now, our Bible college said, don't use the methods of Paul. He got a few converts. But get out there and do what Peter did. We've got to be bold like Peter. Too many people copy Paul. They don't get any converts because he only got a few converts. Look at Peter. There were 3,000 converts. And throw the seed. And you could assume a certain prepared ground out there. Yeah, still rocky and thorny ground, but you could assume a lot of prepared ground so that an evangelist could throw out the seed. There was a place where the seed could take root and you could reap a harvest. But what's happened is the plowed ground by and large has disappeared. It's been cluttered by the rocks of evolutionary geology and the trees of evolutionary biology. The, 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 the uh, devil has sown seeds of destruction. The enemy has sown seeds of destruction. And the church has helped because much of the church helped sow those seeds of destruction. And now when you go out to throw the seed out there, we, we don't realize there's not much prepared ground out there like there used to be. The ground now is cluttered by the rocks of evolutionary geology and the trees of evolutionary biology. And we go out there today and say, you sinner, repent of your sin. I suggest to you they don't understand what you're saying. And what they're really saying is, well, the Bible's not true. We don't trust that message. Science has shown the Bible's not true. And you know what many churches are saying? Oh, look, stay away from evolution. Stay away from that. That's, that's a controversial issue. We don't get involved in controversial issues. They just have. Remember what we talked about yesterday. <laughs> And they're saying, no, just tell them about Jesus. And throughout this country, I have met students at university and churches over and over again who say, our leaders keep telling us, don't deal with the creation evolution issue. That's a red herring. Just tell them about Jesus. What you're telling us is that's the very thing we should be dealing with because that's the problem today. Exactly right. That's why much of our evangelism in universities doesn't work. In fact, one university I went to in Scotland, I think they had about what, 15,000 students or something? And I went to speak at the Christian meeting and the leader of the Christian group was so excited, he said, this is the biggest Christian group we've had in years that I can remember being here. Wow, people are really interested in this. There were 20 students. He said, normally we get six. Boy, there's something wrong. And you know, at one university in Scotland, after I talked, the leader came up to me and he said, you know, we had a forum here where Christians were going to answer questions from, from people about Christianity. And he said, so we had some of the Christian professors with us too and we all had this, this forum. And he said, they threw all sorts of questions at us. He said, you know the question that came up all the time? I said, evolution, death and suffering, those sort of things. Yeah, he said, all the time. What did you do? Well, he said, you know, the Christian professors and that, our leaders have already all told us, don't deal with that. It's a red herring. That's too controversial. Don't deal with that. I said, was the forum very successful? Not really, he said. You know, in America, they speak English, sort of. Any Americans here? <laughs> and, you know, if you, you can speak the same language and not communicate. Did you know that? I have a friend with Wycliffe Bible Translators, and he said, boy, he said, um, did we get into trouble when we went to college and, and learnt the language and thought we could fit straight into the culture he said we didn't fit in at all <laughs> he said one day i preached there's one way to heaven and they wanted to know why there were three ways to heaven and he said what i didn't realize is in that culture they pointed with their fingers down so i said one way they heard three ways another guy was telling me he said you know he said i was trying to teach some young boys mathematics and there were two boys and i said if i've got five bananas how many can you have each and one boy looked at him and said are they ripe He said, I realized I wasn't communicating. <laughs> you know, in America, when they use the word nursing a baby, they mean breastfeeding a baby. In Australia, we had an American girl come to stay with us. We were living there, and I asked her, would she like to nurse our baby? 
And then she nearly died when I said, well, don't worry about it, I'll nurse the baby. Because <laughs> as you know, in Australia, nursing a baby means holding a baby. You know, I thought maybe she thought we Australian males had some onward upward evolutionary mutational change or something like that. But you told me to breastfeed the baby. No, I didn't. I said nurse the baby. Hold the baby. Americans often say to me, well, what do you people call breastfeeding a baby? Breastfeeding a baby. It's what you do, isn't it? I mean, you know, Australians, sort of blunt force, right? Tell it like it is. Now, here's, here's the issue. If you don't understand the culture, you can even use the right words and not communicate. All right? By the way, it's another important lesson for us too with some preachers today. They can use the words that to you sound evangelical, but they're not because the words don't mean the same thing. And unless you understand a lot more about where they're coming from, you will not know what they're really saying. You have to be real careful these days. And you see, it's like this. You imagine you take a non-Christian out to the Grand Canyon in America and you say, can't you see this beautiful canyon, this beautiful world? Isn't it obvious there's a God? He says, all I see are billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. What are you talking about, God? I don't see a God. See, here's the problem. When you look at the world, sorry about the way I see the world, but when you look at the world as a Christian, <laughs> you put on your biblical glasses. And so when you look at the world, when you say, can't you see there's a God of love, what do you mean? You mean there was a perfect world, marred by sin. Death entered. There was a flood. Tower of Babel, different languages. God's law, the cross, the new heavens and new earth to come. So when you're looking at the world through your biblical glasses, that's the world you're seeing. But you see, the non-Christian today, they're looking at the world, the same world, but they've got different glasses on. They've got evolutionary glasses. And they've been taught billions of years of death and bloodshed and all this suffering around here and how can there be a God and the Bible's not true. And you're saying, can't you see there's a God? Look at this beautiful world full of death and suffering. They don't understand what you're talking about anymore. They've lost the foundation. They don't have that foundation. Sin to them doesn't mean, you know, in, in America, for instance, what's sin these days? I mean, even murder. You can't blame him. Somebody stole an ice cream off him when he's four years old, psychologically affected. You can't blame him for what he's done. That's not sin. Sin's not abortion, after all. First lady in the United States says abortion's all right. Sin's not homosexual behavior. The president of the United States says that's all right. You see, people, the culture has changed. And to, to illustrate what I want to say here, well, let me, let me give you a practical illustration. New Tribes Mission, for instance. You've heard of New Tribes Mission. They have a display down the exhibition hall. New Tribes Mission and many other mission organizations have developed a means of communicating the gospel to pagan tribes that really works. You know what they do? Now, sit, just hold on your seat because you'll fall off when you hear this. this. is so radical. Most people can't believe it. I mean, it's extremely radical. Here's what they do. You ready? They start at the beginning. That's incredibly radical. You see, when you go down and rent a movie... And you go and buy a book. What do you do? You rip out the first pages. You, you, you start in the middle. You don't, what do you want to start at the beginning for of anything? That's stupid. Is that how you look at a movie? No, you start from the beginning, don't you? Of course we always start from the beginning. Except, of course, Christians don't, when they read the Bible, we start in the middle. Or towards the end. How inconsistent of us. People have lost the beginning today. And we haven't realized that. And so, you see... What they do is this. When, when they found when they went out and preached, you sinner, repent of your sin and had all these natives make commitments, they found out they really didn't have a lot of sincere commitments. Those people really didn't understand. In fact, they realized they really weren't reaching them. And so they developed this program where they start from the beginning. Genesis, there's a God. Who created? Six days. Perfect world. Adam, first man. Your great granddaddy. Sinned. Death as a result. We're separated from God. Lost. The, the flood, judgment, fossils, death. The Tower of Babel, different languages, different cultures. That's where you came from. God's law, the message of the cross. Jesus, the last Adam, take the first Adam's place. We understand. It doesn't make a difference when you read a book and when you get the beginning, you help, it helps you understand the, the end, doesn't it? Because when you get the plot, it makes a big difference, doesn't it? Like one lady said to me after a creation seminar, oh, I became a Christian two years ago. Nobody ever taught me from Genesis. Now that you've taught that, wow, she said, it's like watching a movie. It was like watching a movie from the middle. Now it's from the beginning. Now I understand the plot. Wow. She was so excited. I've heard that many times. 
By the way, when people become Christians in your churches, what's the first thing you should do? Do what every church does. You start with the book of John or Matthew or Mark or something. I think you should start with Genesis. After all, Matthew, Mark and Luke and John are dependent on Genesis. If you don't give them a foundation, they're not going to understand, ultimately. Not totally. That's why we have weak Christians. I'm not saying you have to believe Genesis to become a Christian. But man, I tell you what, unless you understand Genesis, you're not going to be a consistent Christian. You won't have the foundation. You see, people, what we need to do today is a radical approach in our churches. You know what it is? I think we need to do what New Tribes Mission do. In fact, I, I encourage you to have a look at their materials. They have a children's edition and they have an adult edition. You know what it does? Very simply, it teaches chronologically through the Bible, step by step by step by step. What a radical concept. Instead of just a machine gun approach, you actually connect it to history. What it's missing for our world here is a creation apologetic at the beginning. You add in the books like the Genesis record, the lie, creation, the facts of life, those video series that we have at the beginning, and then do a chronological approach through history, what a difference it makes. You see, we're developing a Sunday school curriculum we hope will be available in a couple of years. Well, maybe a year. It depends on time and finance. But this is what's going to be. But you can do this using the materials we've got. Here it is. Here's the timeline of history. I call it the seven C's. Creation, corruption, catastrophe, Christ in a manger, Cross, consummation. Was that seven? I hope it was. Here, here's, what, here's what we're saying. Here's the timeline of, of history. God created in six days. A perfect world. The first man and woman. The garden. The tree. Sin. The fall. Death as a result. The flood. Death. Fossils. Tower of Babel. Languages. Cultures. The giving of the law. The message of the cross. The resurrection. The new heavens and new earth to come. Every single thing you teach in Christianity goes back to that timeline of history. And that's the very timeline that's missing from most people's thinking. That's why I've said to you, for most Christians, Christianity is sort of some pie in the sky, it's some airy-fairy belief over here. This is a religious book over here because most of our Christian leaders have not connected it to history. And so for us, Christianity is based not in history, it's based in some interesting stories and we have all these Bible stories and so on. And so, you see, we're teaching Bible stories to our kids, but here's the next problem. Most people sitting in the pews in our churches are Greeks in their thinking and not Jews. And we approach them as if they're Jews, and they are not. And what happens today, I might stand on some people's toes if I say this, but like in America, a lot of churches are saying, people aren't coming to church like they used to, and we can't reach the secular world. We've got to bridge the gap between the church and the secular world. And so what they do is they have these, what I call, seeker-sensitive services that basically have all sorts of entertainment programs. You water down the teaching of the Word because that way will attract the people in. And I say, no, 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 it's not going to work, not in the long run. You might get some increase in population in your church locally from attracting them from other churches because you have some interesting entertainment programs. And, you know, some of them get involved. In God. One preacher was t talking on the second coming and, he, and they had ropes on him and pulled him up through the, through the ceiling of the church to illustrate the rapture and all this sort of stuff. And... You know, and, and that sort of thing. And I went to a church recently where he said, we have seeker-sensitive services here, and I didn't hear the Bible mentioned once in his whole sermon, and I, I didn't understand the sermon anyway. And it was a lot of entertainment and other sorts of things. Do you know what I think we need to do? Moratorium, stop! Number one, we need to find out where our people are at sitting in the pews. Number two, we need to realize that our people can't defend their faith and don't know the basics of their faith and have been influenced by evolution, evolutionizing and secularizing their Greek and their thinking. Number three, we need to teach them some basic apologetics. How do you know there's a God? Where did God come from? How do you know the Bible's true? Why is the Bible the inspired word of God? What does it mean? What is our doctrine? Where does it come from? Teach foundationally. Then we need to teach chronologically through Scripture and we need to teach them all about the Christian faith. And once they're equipped, then we should send them out to Mars Hill like Paul did to the Greeks. And on a one-to-one -one basis, I still believe that's one of the greatest means of evangelism in reaching people and I believe you'll see souls, one to the Lord, who will come into the church. Now, I've got one last section I want to do, and I'm going to have to do it uh, rather quickly here. By the way, a lot of churches don't want to take up creation evangelism. Do you know why? They want quick fix solutions. We want the emphasis is on numbers. I don't believe the emphasis should be on numbers. It should be on teaching the word, but teaching it in the culture the way the people want to understand it. Not numbers. There is no, except that, the Lord can do anything. I understand that. From a human perspective, there's no quick fix solution to something that's taken 100 and 
40 years of intense evolutionary indoctrination and humanistic secular indoctrination that's changed the foundation of the culture. There really is no quick fix solution. I don't deny the Lord through his Holy Spirit could do a marvelous work, but I don't believe that'll be until God's people get back to God's word. I'd rather you were hot or cold if you're lukewarm, I'll spew out of my mouth. The two, the two guys that I spoke to just recently, um, one of you guys was at, um, at the food table. Could you come down here real quick? And Mark, are you here? Are you here? Here they are. Um, I just met the, these guys at, at, the, at the convention here. And let me just uh, start with um, Warwick. Warwick. Let me just start. Warwick, just real quickly. Um, you went to a creation seminar, I understand. Yes, two years ago in Ipswich. In Ipswich. Okay, and what happened? Um, basically, I was, I was seeking the Lord, and uh, I was having a problem with evolution, creation. I was going down like a parallel line where there's no, no meeting point. And, um, sorry. And um, basically, the, a group of people from the church said there was a Ken Ham, Gary Parker creation meeting in Ipswich. Would you like to come along? So I said, yes, great. You know, that's probably what I needed. And I went, listened, and here I am today, converted. It's through this man and his teaching. You know, evolution to me now is nothing. God is everything. Thanks, Mike. Come over here where we... I forgot about the cameras here, so... Mark, you uh, live in Coventry. Coventry? Com whatever it is. Coventry. Yeah. Um, I understand that you are an atheist. Yeah, I was the uh, exact, exact opposite to that chap there. I was actually looking to reject God um, and my wife said there's a creation science uh, seminars on so I went along to see if I could uh, rubbish it and uh, being scientifically minded I thought I had science on my side and uh, that to be perfectly honest people who believed in the Bible and have to excuse me because this is in my dead days um, they were a bit stupid and a bit ignorant so um, I went along to these seminars didn't I feel stupid and ignorant? Um, I, I understand that uh, Dr. Gary Parker, who spoke, uh, particularly some of the scientific evidences he gave in the context of scripture, of course, really opened your eyes. Yeah. Um, I sort of class myself as a reasonably scientific and informed uh, person, but um, not only with just very simple but very precise science, Gary Parker um, not only knocked down my wall of humanistic thinking he, he brought the whole house down which made me receptive to the gospel and then uh, later on you said you read the book the lie and what is creation science uh, you didn't become a christian straight away no it was about um, about three four months five months i'm not entirely sure because it, it was a gradual um, transition uh, i was at university at the time and i went into the library and i got these big thick books on evolution out and i thought let's have a look at this again um and I couldn't find any origin for it, any mechanism or any evidence for it. And that's in the, the, the most up-to-date books. Um, and gradually, as I read the scriptures, I saw how the world is. Um, I understand why it is like it is today. Um, and before, I used to live sort of a bit, bit uh, in despair and bitterness um, and sort of confined to the secular world. But uh, now that the Bible has um, re released me, I'm freer. I live in hope with faith and with Christ. Thanks a lot, Mark. Appreciate it. And I just think this is quite an appropriate time, actually, to, to thank my wife, who stayed close to me. God must have given her the strength and the guidance through five long years of um, terrible atheism and, uh, and bitter rebukes at the church. And uh, I thank our local church for their prayers. And uh, eventually they led me to God. Actually, um, you know, that does remind me of 1 Peter 2 where it talks about Christ being submissive to the point of death on the cross and then it says in 1 Peter 3, likewise, wives, be submissive to your husbands so they may be one uh, without a word. And uh, uh, there's a testimony of a faithful wife who did that. That's really great. By the way, those two testimonies are not unique in the sense that as I travel around, in fact, back at our office, we have reams of letters of similar testimonies. And we're finding churches in America and Australia that have taken up creation evangelism, first of all equipping their own people, getting that sorted out, and then equipping them to go out and witness, they've seen a big difference. For the first time, people say, we're not ashamed to stand up for Christ and we've got answers. We've got answers. And you see people, if you're going to witness to a Muslim 
or a Jehovah's Witness or, or someone like that, one of the things that you've got to understand is how they think. And you see, it's interesting, as I was talking to Mark before too, when he was an atheist and a humanist, he had on those glasses, he couldn't put on the biblical glasses, he didn't understand it. Now that he's a Christian, he's got the biblical glasses on, but he can also put on the humanist glasses and he can understand how they think. And you see, once you understand as a Christian how you think foundationally and you've got those glasses on, you then realize the other people think foundationally too and you can put their glasses on and once you can do that and you can swap these glasses, so to speak, then you know how to witness to them. Because until you understand where their thinking comes from, you're not going to be able to reach them. But until you understand where your thinking comes from, you won't even understand how they think. And that's why we've got to understand as Christians that we need to be equipped foundationally. Now, what I want to do in the last few moments here, and this really, I've just finished the introduction to creation evangelism. Uh, what we need to do, I'm going to do this real quickly, so please excuse me. I'm going to talk fast for a change. And what I want to show you is understanding the... See, creation evolution and creation evangelism is not just about creation evolution. It's also about understanding thinking foundationally. Do you, do you see that now? Creation evolution is not just about ape men and fossils and creation evangelism is not just about creation versus evolution. Once you understand where your thinking comes from and you understand the foundational nature of the book of Genesis, once you understand that everyone starts from presuppositions, see, that's what creation evangelism is all about. And then what you need to do is start to realize Paul used different methods for different people. Jesus used different methods for different people. And so then you start to need to start categorizing the different people in our culture and start thinking about how to reach them. Now, I believe the greatest mission field in this area to start with is the church. I really do. Because most of the people are Greeks. They're not Jews. And so when, what I've done is I've looked at various groups. And I just want to run through just to show you quickly how this works. And also, many of the materials you've already purchased to show you how you can use uh, these materials uh, in, your, in your witnessing. When I go to a church, I find that most people are in one or two positions or in between. They might believe in creation, might even believe in Genesis. They might even believe in the absolutes of Christianity, but they don't understand the connection in the way we've talked about it. Or they compromise with evolution in millions of years. You often see, by the way, they don't have real good doctrine in, in, in their lives and, and, and see it start to collapsing. And so what I do is I say, let's look at the inconsistencies of these various groups. For instance, this group here. If you've got no connection, there's no reason for your doctrines. So when you try to put those doctrines in the next generation, your children, if you don't build them from a foundation up, why will they stand? And in many instances, they don't. Often they've got the wrong understanding of science because they still think millions of years and think these other things, even though they might sort of believe Genesis. They don't realize that evolution is not science. And so you've got no foundational connection for the next generation. You'll lose it in the next generation or a generation after if you're not careful. The other group, not only do you have no connection, you've actually got the wrong foundation you've then also got no basis for your doctrines. Because you see, once you compromise with Genesis, for instance, I have found it, it's, it's a consistent pattern. Christian leaders in America that are soft on issues like homosexual behavior and don't really know what to say about them, you find ultimately they don't really believe Genesis the way that they should. Because you see, once you believe Genesis, it's easy. The answer's easy. God made Adam and Eve. He didn't make Adam and Steve. He made a man and a woman. I mean, it's so easy. We, the answer is easy. It really is. But you see, if you're soft on Genesis, you'll be soft on these other things because you won't know what to say. You won't really have an answer. So your foundation won't allow your doctrines to stand. And people who try to be New Testament Christians, but they really don't believe the Old Testament, particularly Genesis, they struggle with the Christian doctrines in the New Testament because what do you do with some of these things? But it's all dependent on Genesis. And then, of course... There's this generation. These tend to be the older generation. You know, Mr. and Mrs. Brown have a good Christian ethic, Christian morality, but they don't go to church or might go at Easter and Christmas in case it's true. They believe in evolution. It's on the tally. Has to be true. David Attenborough, he wouldn't lead us astray. What do you do with those people? Well, you know, it's interesting. You see, what you've got to do is point out the logical inconsistency. What happens when your son comes home and says, listen, Dad, give me one good reason why I can't marry Bob. Well, it's not right, it goes against my grain, it's not normal, it's wrong, you shouldn't do it, it's terrible, it's awful. But Dad, why shouldn't I marry Bob? Well, it's wrong, it's not right, it's... Well, Dad, that's your opinion. Well, um, well, no, it's, 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 it's not right. Well, why isn't it right, Dad? Well, it's wrong. And well, um, well, Dad, that's your opinion. Well, no, it's not right. And 
Hey, Mr. Brown, the only way you can defend marriage as one man for one woman for life is if you believe in Genesis. And that means you've got to believe God's word. You see, you have a Christian morality, but you don't have a foundation for it. Man, you've got a problem. No one, how can you expect your kids to believe what you believe? And you know, it's interesting. The Mr. and Mrs. Browns, now this is true. I find that they're the ones that were often brought up in the church, but the church never gave them answers, which caused them to rebel against Christianity. You'll laugh at this, but this is a true story. A friend of mine in Australia, he lived beside a 90-year-old man who was not a Christian. And one day he called out to my friend. He was in trouble. He wanted to call the ambulance. Massive pains in his chest, down his arm. Heart attack. And so my friend went down, and he was real burdened for this man he tried to witness to. And so he's talking to, to him, Bill, Bill, you need to trust the Lord, Bill. I mean, this could be the end, end of you, Bill. And Bill, you've never trusted the Lord. And he said, oh, I don't believe the Bible. You know I don't believe the Bible. He said, but Bill, the Bible's true. It really is God's word. You believe the Bible? I know you believe the Bible. And here he is in the middle of a heart attack and he said, all right, where did Cain get his wife? <laughs> true story. By the way, I read, a, I read a letter to the editor in Arizona. An old man wrote in, he's 70-something years old, and he said, I rejected Christianity when my pastor never could answer the question, where did Cain get his wife? I found his name in the phone book and called him up and said, I got the answer, would you like it? You see, they have a Christian ethic, but they have a wrong foundation for it. They think evolution is science, and it's not. Now, let me just show you, with, uh, with the Christians, I encourage you to, the, the Genesis Solution video, were, that's a message that I developed over a number of years, thinking about all the people sitting in a church. There's those that believe in creation, those that don't, those that believe in evolution, they don't understand the connection, don't understand the relevance. And so that's really a concise message to hit them hard. And that's, I encourage you to show uh, that video. Also, the Genesis record I've been really pushing is a book because it helps you go verse by verse through the book of Genesis. By the way, I've got a few more groups to do yet. I just want to show you how you can use these. And so that's really great for uh, getting an understanding of the first 11 chapters. The lie can be used to really give them the relevance of the issue. It's the message of the movie, The Genesis Solution, in much more detail and why it matters. And Graham, you can just hold those up for me as I do them, how foundational it is. For children, A is for Adam, teaches the gospel. I had a lady write to us just recently. She said, we read through that twice with our six-year-old son. And at the end, he said, Mommy and Daddy, I want my name to be in the Lamb's Book of Life. And so they knelt down with him and he asked the Lord into his life. That's what these books are for. How do you deal with the scientific issues? Well, little books like Stones and Bones deal with some of those issues in a way you can understand. Great witnessing tool for people in churches and for the Mr. and Mrs. Browns. Creation Magazine... I really encourage you all to get that because that'll help you witness to Mr. and Mrs. Brown's next door and to the people in your church. Great sermon material, by the way. You know what you can do in your sermons, Pastor? When you get Creation Magazine, you say, yeah, I know we're in, the, we're in the book of Ecclesiastes today, but just wanted to tell you, did you know in the latest Creation Magazine, the, the ape man that the papers said they found two months ago, they've now said that it's not an ape man after all. Here's another example. You see what I mean? That's the sort of thing you can do. The video series... This is one of the best ways I think you can reach people in your own church and witnessing to neighbours and friends. And uh, a lot of people today, some of the ways in which you can evangelise today with your neighbour, I want to leave this video with you. I'll collect it next week. I'll keep pestering you till you watch it. Make sure you watch it. If not, we've got a roast lamb dinner on tomorrow night. <laughs> Come over. <laughs> Sit them down. Roast lamb dinner. And then you can also have Ham and Parker on the TV. Um, so, you know... The, the Answers book, of course, is great for the Mr. and Mrs. Browns as well as people in church because it gives those answers. Where did Cain get his what? Another group are often the Mr. and Mrs. Browns' children. Maybe they're your children or grandchildren. Kids that have gone to university and college, like Mark, for instance, taught evolution as fact. And for them, they have a relative morality. They don't understand that this foundation connects to this. They, they think evolution science has nothing to do with their morality, but it does. And for those people, what I've found is very successful is using like uh, Gary Parker's book, Creation, the Facts of Life, that uh, the classic Darwinian evidence is refuted. But uh, what you're really doing too is, is showing them that we're starting from the Bible. The Bible explains the evidence. Evolution doesn't. They think science can prove the past. So you use material like that to witness to them. Or the video, Mount St. Helens. Now, Mount St. Helens, really a lot of people, that, that really opens their mind to the gospel because they say, you mean you don't need the billions of years? You mean that happened in... That little inky-dinky volcano did that, you know. And uh, with these people, though, they have no purpose and meaning in life. But you know what? I find a lot of them are crying out for purpose and meaning because it's written on their hearts. They don't understand that it's this that connects to that. I can use the quotes like Jeffrey Dahmer and others to show them 
what happened and then to talk about purpose and meaning in life it, it, I can start from the scripture and start to show them then why not only does the Bible explain the evidence in these areas it also gives you a basis for purpose and meaning and we see many one to the Lord like that and I'd say that's sort of similar to Mark and then of course you have people like this the ardent atheist evolution's fact they know it's connected to their morality I mean Thomas Huxley knew that the Huxleys knew we want evolution because it justifies our, our what we would call sin justifies their morality in fact they've made statements like that but for these people you need to deal with them look at their inconsistencies because they will have certain standards they believe certain things are right and wrong why and point out their inconsistencies I had an atheist come to me at one seminar and he uh, <laughs> this atheist was more consistent than most and he said to me I had a group of them actually from the university and they come up and said we don't believe a word you said that's oh, fine he said we're atheists I said really he said yep he said actually to be honest as atheists we don't believe there's God. We don't believe in any absolutes. He said, to be honest, we don't even believe in reality. And then he said, to be honest, we can't even be sure any of us are really here. I said, well, why are you asking me the question for? And he said, good point. I said, what point? And then he said to me, well, maybe we should go home. I said, maybe it's not there. And he said to me, good point which I replied what point <laughs> anyway it got us talking about some of these things but see I was also pointing out the inconsistency of, of, the, of their own position they assume absolute knowledge of evolution these sort of people they say evolution's fact what they're saying today is evolution's fact because we're here so you have to challenge it do you know everything you know one of the ways I found to witness to them is to get them to admit that they don't know everything and what about all the information they don't know and look at the way evolution has changed but because they're committed to their atheism, they say, we're here because evolution must be true because we're here. But there's all sorts of arguments even we've used today that you can use with them. But the thing that they are saying today is, we admit that natural selection and mutation don't work as a mechanism. It doesn't work. So they say evolution's fact, we just don't know how it happens. The interesting thing is, do you know what that does for the next generation they're teaching in the universities? It provides an incomplete foundation for the next generation because you need something to make it work. And you really need a mystical element, which is why you'll hear more and more people in our culture today talking about God and talking about finding God, but it's not the God of the Bible. It's a mystical God that they need to make it work. And so, who's got the answer? Well, people like Shirley MacLaine have the answer. Because, you see, if you take evolution and its worldview and you wrap it in a New Age philosophy then you've got the answer because that provides a mystical element as a substitute for God. And when you try to witness to this generation here, and these are the ones coming out of universities and colleges today, they're almost impossible to talk to because they have gone so far now. You know, some of the ways you can look at them, if, if you, if you um, believe these things, how can God be good and evil? How can God be health and disease? How can God be a part of the creation? You know, and you can start to deal with some of those inconsistencies in a particular way. Remember one seminar I was at, there was a Baha'i faith person and some other Hare Krishna and some other guy come to a Gary Parker and myself and said, wonderful, wonderful seminar. Really enjoyed it. I said, oh, what did we do wrong, Gary? And uh, I mentioned something about being born again. Ah, oh, next time we'll come back as a cow. Yes, yes. You know, <laughs> you know, didn't you hear what we said? Yes, if it's real. Yes, if you're real. Yes, yes. Are you real? I don't know. Am I real? I tell you, they're very difficult to talk to. They really are. And you know what? That's where we're getting to. And that's where some of your grandchildren are. And your great-grandchildren. Because of the way we've let them be indoctrinated. In fact, people... And I can't spend much time on this. We've run out of time. We've got one minute. By the way, let me say that uh, Gary Parker's book um, and some of the other materials there can be really good for, for reaching those sort of people too, to a degree. Because you know what I find? everybody's inconsistent and even though they might say that there's no reality and all the rest of it underneath it all they have to live as if there is and so you can still use some of those sorts of things to a degree by the way your children that are ending up like that you know if you had have showed them books like the great dinosaur mystery when they were young and trained them in the truth about dinosaurs from the bible and you had have uh, trained them about fossils with books like uh, dry bones which is great for training children about fossils and the Grand Canyon and so on. Or you had have trained them in the truth about the Ice Age. Do we have that book, Graham? Um, the Ice Age, a book which uh, teaches children about Neanderthal man and Cro-Magnon man. 
and knew how to train them in the truth about the development of a baby and and uh, what happens right from the beginning and why some people are deformed and mistakes in our genes and you had to taught them the evidence that the Bible explains in regard to geology and biology and so on then I don't believe your children or grandchildren would be in those positions today and by the way that's to show you that there's some fantastic materials today for to use thanks um, one last thing and then we're going to close this is what many people were like in England. This is what the nation of England was like many generations ago. The Creation Foundation, the doctrines of Christianity. But you know what started to happen? What started to happen was this. People started to adopt doubts in regard to Genesis, which removes your Christian worldview. And eventually they adopted the foundation of evolution, and so that structure began to collapse. And then the next generation built a, a structure consistent with the foundation. And then the final generation today entwine that in a new age philosophy. And you know what? There are many people that can say, yeah, you know, when you think about it, our church once, our great granddad was like that. And then you know what happened? It's true. They, uh, they started to doubt the book of Genesis, Charles Lyell's days and Charles Darwin's days. And then you know what happened? You know, they capitulated to evolution. And yeah, you know what? They didn't have a strong stand on doctrine and so on. And then you know what? Then the kids end up, boy, non-Christian atheists and, and so on. And wow, now some of them are on the tops of mountains holding crystals, humming. And that's where they're at. Well, people, creation evangelism, it's powerful. We need to get out there and restore that foundation, but we need to start in the church. But what we need to do is preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, but in a way that people are going to hear us and understand.